Good morning, everybody. It's January 16th, uh, Tuesday. I hope you all had a uh, good uh, long, long, long weekend uh, celebrating uh, Martin Luther King. Um, and uh, that uh, now uh, you're back in uh, market mode, thinking about uh, where this market's uh, heading. Uh, you know, it is January 16th already. Time, time's already going by pretty quickly here. Last year seemed to whiz by before you know it. It's going to be Christmas here and, and time for a new year for uh, another Santa Claus rally. But uh, before we get there, uh, let's let's see what might happen over the next uh, six months. Um, I'm thinking that uh, the market's uh, f fairly rich in terms of valuation multiples. Um, I sent out a uh, quick takes that showed the uh, uh, S&P 500, 400 and 600 relative to their blue angels. You know, that formation where I show forward earnings, and I show it to relative to different valuation multiples. And uh, the S&P 500 is uh, close to 20 on a forward PE basis. Uh, the good news is that earnings have been making a comeback, and earnings are at a record high, so that uh, the rally we've uh, had is consistent with uh, the end of the uh, mild earnings recession we had, which is really a profit margin recession. And uh, now we're going up along with, uh, with earnings, uh, but we're a little bit ahead of earnings, obviously, with a multiple uh, close to 20. Think out the mega cap eight, and you've got a multiple of 17, which is uh, more reasonable uh, than than 20. Um, but uh, I think one does have to look uh, at the S&P 492 in order to find something that uh, isn't as expensive as the mega cap eight. And the mega cap eight uh, seem to move together in unison, but every now and then, they have their own unique issues. Tesla's got some issues right now. And so they don't always move in, in lockstep. And sometimes there's some profit taking that occurs in, in that area. Uh, my uh, my main concern in, in addition to valuation is uh, the market uh, seems to have discounted a substantial cut in short-term uh, interest rates by the Federal Reserve. I'm still looking for two to three cuts and that's in the second half of the year. Uh, I'm, I'm more inclined to think about two rather than three because I think the economy is going to do fine. Uh, and I think the uh, inflation is going to come down. And some Fed officials might uh, have said that if inflation comes down, they will probably have to lower the federal funds rate because if they don't, that'll turn out to be more restrictive if you're looking at real interest rates. It's an interesting theoretical uh, uh, argument, uh, but I think a more practical uh, issue for the Fed here is the possibility of uh, geopolitical disturbances pushing the price of oil up again, as it ha has happened in the 1970s. Uh, as you know, I've been discussing the two alternative scenarios for the decade, one being the repeat of the inflation of the 1970s, and the other one being something more like the 1920s or the roaring uh, 2020s. And uh, I think uh, the news and the data have come in in such a way that supports the idea of a roaring 2020. Certainly the stock market seems to be thinking about a roaring 2020 scenario uh, with all the excitement about uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, but I'm not going to tell you that uh, there's uh, no risk anymore of a 1970s style problem. In the 1970s, we had um, two uh, energy shocks. So far, we've had one energy shock that occurred in uh, 2022. Uh, and now there's a potential with the uh, Middle East situation continuing to spin out of control. Uh, there's a potential for that to have an impact on oil. So far, it isn't. So far, the price of oil uh, continues to fall. And I think that's a, that, that's a, a good sign that uh, as, as crazy as things are, are right now in the Middle East, and as crazy as they might get, uh, the, the world is slow enough. There's enough uh, oil around from... Uh, other sources uh, than, than Iran, if that's what we're talking about. But if we're talking about something more substantial where it's hard to get Saudi oil uh, th through the uh, through the straits there, then obviously we got a whole different ki kind of uh, story going on. Uh, it's uh, disturbing that uh, the situation does cont continue to uh, 
uh, get worse. That uh, doesn't seem to be stabilizing. And I'm not talking about, of course, just uh, the, the war between Israel and Hamas, uh, but also the, the war between Israel, and the United States, and Iran. I, I know that the administration doesn't want to have a war with Iran, but uh, that doesn't mean that Iran doesn't want to have a war with the United States. And uh, certainly by providing all these uh, uh, missiles and drones uh, to the Houthis uh, in uh, Yemen, I think I pronounced that right, Houthis or Houthis. Um, anyways, uh, it's no joke. They're they're you know quite quite a serious threat to global shipping. And if you looked at the maps, you can see that uh, taking a, a vessel uh, from Asia uh, through the Red Sea, through the Suez Canal, up to Europe is a lot shorter trip than going all the way around Africa. And we've already had some dis disruptions in uh, supply of uh, parts that are necessary to make uh, cars, for example, in uh, in Europe. So I, I think Paul is aware of all that. I'm sure he's aware of all that. And uh, he may decide that uh, there's no point in uh, easing too too quickly here uh, to lowering lowering interest rates only to have a energy uh, crisis situation in which Inflation becomes a an issue again, so I think uh, there's a, there's a few reasons why I think the market is overreacting here and thinking that uh, interest rates are coming down. I think the market's right that inflation's coming down, uh, but whether you know the knee jerk uh, conclusion is that if inflation comes down surprisingly well, which has sort of been a been our position, that that will uh, convince the Fed that they've got to lower interest rates. Uh, sooner rather than later and uh, cut interest rates uh, more often. Let's look at uh, some of the uh, charts that are relevant to this uh, discussion we're having. So let's go over here, I'll share with you. So uh, this is uh, our uh, charts from the uh, morning briefing. For those of you who uh, get it and read it, I hope you do. Um, anyways, let's uh, look at uh, figure one here and what you can see is the uh, CPI headline and core. The CPI came out for December. We're still waiting for the uh, inflation rate on a PCED basis that'll come out later this uh, month. But it's pretty clear that uh, inflation remains on a downward uh, trend. Um, some people looked at uh, the number that came out of the CPI and said, well, you know, it's 3.9%. Uh, that's uh, it, it kind of been... Uh, stalled around here that's still well above the feds two percent target so you can't really declare they can't declare mission accomplished they might feel better about how quickly inflation has come down uh, but uh they've uh, got a th their credibility is on the line here in terms of them stating that they definitely want to get inflation down to two percent um and of course when they say that they really are talking about the core rate but i think we all generalize and say well two percent is kind of where we'd like to see most of the major inflation indicators, whether it be the headline or the core. Um, I'd point out something we've been uh, noting, that uh, inflation tends to be fairly symmetrical, that once it peaks, uh, the rate at which it comes down tends to be very similar to the rate it, uh, it, it went up. A lot of that is arithmetic, year over year percent changes, but it also suggests uh, that inflation can be spiky, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a a structural secular problem it could be a very short cyclical problem and i still think a lot of this was related to the pandemic uh, supply chain disruptions and what happened in housing and rents and all that and so uh, this has been reversed pretty quickly and i think we're going to continue to see this come down i'm not too worried about the last few miles of uh, trying to get to to this goal uh well i'm not worried about it uh, the, the fed chair and his colleagues uh, do have to be concerned that they shouldn't be too relaxed about getting inflation down from here to here just because it came down so sharply. So let's uh, let's not do that. Okay. See why this thing seems to be stuck. Okay. Yeah. When I uh, prepared for this uh, call, I uh, opened up the the charts and it said 404 error, which is kind of like that blue screen of death. But anyways, I found the charts. So figure two. Uh, shows you a um, scenario that we want at all costs to avoid. Uh, and it's not necessarily anything that the Fed or anybody else has any control of, over if it's geopolitical rel geopolitical related. And here you can see this is the history uh, from 1965 to 1985 uh, for the uh, uh, inflation rate. And as you can see, uh, 
But we did, inflation was starting to go up before the uh, OPEC oil embargo. So there were already inflationary pressures. You know, the, the great inflation really started in the, in the 60s, mid, mid 60s, second half of the 60s, uh, when Johnson decided that he was going to finance the Vietnam War uh, with uh, deficit financing. So it was guns and butter. And so that created an inflation problem. A recession here uh, brought inflation down. And then it started to, to pick up again for all sorts of reasons. Uh, Nixon um, closed the gold window. The dollar took a dive. Commodity prices soared. Uh, and I'm not talking about oil. I'm talking about things like uh, soybean. Uh, food prices soared. And then uh, OPEC, uh, I think, in some ways, certainly responded to the closing of the gold window and the depreciation of the dollar by concluding that they weren't getting enough uh, money for their uh, oil with the dollar depreciating. So as a result, the price of oil uh, uh, soared as a result of the embargo, which was related to the um, uh, to the war in the, in the Middle East back then. Uh, so we kept going up. I had another recession, and recessions do bring in, uh, inflation down, and it worked again uh, over here. Um, and uh, then, of course, uh, we entered another inflationary peak, uh, and this one was exacerbated by the Iranian Revolution. Uh, and so we had a, a twin peak in the inflation rate. And then nothing like good old-fashioned recessions uh, to bring inflation down. So that was uh, one heck of a roller coaster ride, to, to say the least, as you can see in the chart. My little mouse here just doesn't want to... There it goes. Okay, let's go. we overdid it. Uh, this is the... Uh, fortunately, my screen is... Uh, touch I can touch it and move it. So anyways, Consumer Price Index... 1914 to present, uh, what you could see there uh, is that the, um, what you see there is that uh, the, since 1914, the inflation story, the year over year percent change in the CPI, and you can see that uh, again, there tends to be a symmetrical aspects to, aspect to inflation. Uh, this in some ways was an outlier, uh, but uh, these were two spikes uh, and then a combination of geopolitical uh, bad luck and a combination of uh, domestic uh, policy uh, excesses um, led to this twin, twin peak situation. So is this going to be a twin peak? Um, I think if it's, it's going to be, it's going to be geopolitics again. I think the Fed uh, certainly is uh, aware of this risk and is going to do everything it can to credibly uh, squash uh, the possibility of this happening again. But again, it's not all uh, in their control, much will depend on uh, geopolitical developments. Um, this is uh, a bigger picture of the crude oil uh, from 2008 to now, and uh, the twin peak possibility here. We had this peak with the Russia attacks on Ukraine, uh, Hamas attacks Israel, and then, you know, is this a possibility? There's a, a lot of reasons uh, why it's probably not very likely. Uh, that have to do with supply and demand for oil on a global basis. China's in a severe property-led uh, recession, and so the demand for oil out of China is weak. Um, electric vehicles uh, uh, aren't catching on everywhere, but there's enough of them that uh, maybe that's having some impact on the demand for gasoline. And of course, with a lot of people working from home now or hybrid uh, working, uh, there's less commuting going on. Uh, but most importantly is that there seems to be lots lots of oil out there. For example, the U.S. crude oil field production is, I'm sure you've seen this chart uh, of late. We've been showing it. Others have been showing it. We're at 13.2 uh, million barrels per day in um, U.S. crude oil field production, which is really pretty impressive. Uh, the U.S. is uh, energy independent, unlike when uh, Jimmy Carter gave us the Malay speech back in uh, the late 70s, uh, telling us to turn our thermostats down um, and to, to drive more slowly. Uh, we are energy independent, and you can see that in the uh, the blue line is the difference between the green and the red, and the green is uh, exports, uh, the red is imports, and this is uh, net imports of uh, crude oil. So we are a net exporter of, of crude oil. Uh, we're also a net exporter of uh, natural gas. And that's been very important uh, in terms of helping the uh, Europeans deal with their uh, uh, supply disruptions related to the Ukraine-Russian war. 
Well, let's take a look at some of the uh, recent inflation indicators to see where we're at in that regard. Uh, this is just a, a couple of charts here on uh, expected inflation. And as you can see, uh, this is the, the one year ahead from the Survey Research Center, the one year ahead from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And uh, they've certainly been trending down. They look somewhat volatile, uh, tend to be fairly much driven by the price of gasoline. Uh, since uh, when you talk about inflation to the average person, the one price they see almost every day uh, is the price of gasoline. And at least once a week, they're filling up their tanks. So they're very aware of that. Um, and uh, this is the five-year ahead uh, survey of consumers. Again, as, uh, from the two alternative sources, uh, just for fun, we are averaging them. And you can see that uh, the, the average of the two of them is 2.7%, which I think uh, Fed officials would uh, describe as uh, well anchored. This again is uh, the S, uh, the SRC um, one year ahead expected inf inflation uh, rate, and it's 3.1%. Uh, and this is uh, shows the correlation with the price of gasoline. So price of gasoline's come down. That's helped to bring down inflation expectation. Uh, yeah, we all know this, that energy energy is an extremely important uh, component in uh, pricing. It uh, affects just about everything, uh, transportation costs, production costs, and so on. And so um, the outlook for energy is critically important in determining whether we're going to have another inflation problem here. Uh, I would say that uh, one thing that's kind of interesting is if you look at the CPI less shelter, that's the headline, and you look at the core of uh, uh, excluding energy and food and shelter, uh, you see that the Fed has actually achieved its target. Uh, we're at 1.8% on the headline excluding shelter, and we're at 2.2% uh, excluding shelter. Now, why, why exclude shelter? Because I always take out whatever doesn't support my story, <laughs> uh, as all economists do. But we all slice and dice these numbers. Uh, I've been arguing that uh, you don't want to slice and dice the numbers on inflation too much, uh, because the Fed isn't going to be able to con control what it costs you to take your dog to the vet or for hair grooming uh, or for uh, health insurance and auto insurance. And uh, some economists have become real experts at the minutia of all the components of the CPI. And that's kind of looking at the trees, whereas uh, the Fed really is, uh, focuses on the forest, the overall inflation rate. Uh, but Powell and other Fed officials have acknowledged that the shelter component, the rent component, is uh, kind of a funky uh, component that's, that lags and doesn't fully reflect that current market um, uh, rent uh, rent inflation. So uh, it's legitimate, I think, to take out uh, shelter and to recognize that we're there. All we got to do is wait for shelter inflation to come down. And it's been sticky, but uh, it's heading in the right direction. It's downwards. Uh, then uh, Powell did do some slicing and dicing of I think about a year ago on the uh, PCED, the personal consumption expenditures deflator, and said that uh, that the Fed is looking at um, the uh, on a core basis, they're taking out energy and food, and then they're looking at uh, goods inflation, then they're looking at housing inflation, and then service inflation excluding housing. So service inflation excluding housing is what we're looking at here. Uh, for the PCED uh, on a core basis. So services, less energy, and housing is the, the blue line. And for a while there, the Fed, uh, particularly Powell, was pointing out that uh, the uh, so-called super core inflation rate, I don't know why that uh, term came about. It's, uh, anyways, uh, the super core inflation rate's been stuck around 5%, and that's disturbing, and it's tied to uh, wage inflation and wage inflation isn't coming down fast enough, so it's gonna, so inflation is gonna persist. Well, not so, not so. Uh, according to this, the uh, the super core inflation isn't so super core after all. It's already down to three and a half percent, and it does correlate with something that is sort of a super core in the CPI, which is uh, at three point four percent. So some people looked at that. I said, oh, the super CPI is telling us the super core is sticky, and the uh, I don't see it that way. And I think inflation's coming down faster than widely expected and we'll be down at 2%, 2, 2.5%, leave myself some margin 
by the uh, end of the year. Uh, this is another, uh, this is sort of like everything you you did you did and didn't want to know about inflation is, uh, I guess, the, 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 the subtitle of uh, the morning briefing. But this is a sub the CPI less shelter versus the PPI final demand. The PPI used to be something that just we thought about as uh, producers, but the PPI is basically uh, indexes of what prices producers and providers of goods and um, and services receive. So it's goods and services now. And there is this there is a component there called final demand for personal consumption, and that uh, excludes rent. So not surprisingly, it's a real tight uh, fit with the CPI less shelter. So it's just confirming uh, what all what uh, I've just uh, been looking at that inflation's coming down across the board, no matter which indicator you're looking at. Here's the CPI less shelter versus or PPI, final demand, personal consumption, same kind of story. You can have a closer look at it on your on your own. Um, now, one of the sources of uh, of, of uh, this inflation in the U.S., they've argued, is we don't have to have a recession because the Chinese are having a recession for us, and that's uh, creating deflation over there, so it's depressing their prices. And this is just an update on that story. You look at U.S. import prices from China, down 2.9% year over year in November. I think today or tomorrow, um, the um, import prices are coming out again, and I'm sure they'll they'll confirm that it's still deflating. And here's uh, the US CPI goods X food and energy. So obviously uh, that has uh, an impact on uh, goods inflation in, in the US. Uh, meanwhile, the Eurozone um, had a real problem with energy. You remember how energy prices were off off the charts here, really had to expand the charts. Uh, and now on a year over year basis, symmetrically, they've uh, come down and they're deflating. So that's that's helping to bring inflation down. And then uh, the uh, headline consumer price index uh, has been brought down to a large extent because of energy. But again, energy matters a great deal. So uh, I managed to uh, this time uh, save ourselves uh, quite some time for a little discussion here. And uh, wouldn't you know it, I only have two questions. So if any of you want to chime in, why don't you do that? And then let me put on my other glasses here. And we'll start out with the chip. Uh, chip says, today the NY Empire State Manufacturing Index plunged to minus 43.7 in January 2024, the lowest reading since COVID days. Your take. Yeah, I saw that. And I was going to mention it. I'm glad you asked the question. Uh, we are in a uh, goods recession. I thought uh, we're bottoming in the goods recession. This is not consistent uh, with the idea that uh, we're bottoming in the goods recession. Uh, the uh, five uh, Fed surveys that are conducted by five of the uh, Fed uh, district banks uh, tend to be uh, biased towards manufacturing. And indeed, when we average them together, they tend to be really good coincident indicators of the ISM MPMI, the Manufacturing Purchasing Managers Index that's compiled by the ISM for the uh, for, for the nation. And so the correlation is very tight. And uh, up until this one observation, uh, there was uh, signs that things were bottoming, not that they were kind of going back to expansion uh, territory, but at least things weren't getting any worse on the good side. What's somewhat puzzling is that we know that Consumers' uh, spending on goods has been flattening out for now over a year and a half, maybe two years, uh, but it's flattened out at an all-time record high. So it's not as though people have stopped buying. So I, I, arithmetically, we're in a rolling recession in the goods sector because on a year-over-year -year basis or quarter-over-quarter -quarter basis, um, it just hasn't been uh, growing. It's just been uh, uh, flat. But uh, it, uh, it soared coming out of the lockdowns. This is real spending on goods soared uh, during the lockdowns. And uh, then they kind of flattened out in late 2020, late, late 2020, right into 2021. They started to flatten out because people kind of maxed out uh, on uh, buying goods, uh, but they kept buying them. I shouldn't say they maxed out. What they did is they pivoted over to services. So it is a concern to see a number like that. It was uh, really kind of recession level plunge in New York, but um, there's uh, five of them all told 
uh, New York uh, starts the uh, the ball rolling here. We'll get Philadelphia shortly, and we'll all be monitoring that. Uh, and it may indicate that the uh, for one reason or another, there's still a goods recession out there. Um, and yet, um, let's watch other parts of the economy like services and capital spending, fiscal spending, and so on. So, uh, look, uh, the hard landers uh, uh, have uh, been wrong for the past two years. Uh, they could be right this this year, and I'm sure they'll grab at this to say, see, we told you so. Uh, but I think it's premature to make, make that conclusion. And I, I was it was interesting to see. I didn't see much of a reaction from the bond market, so it didn't really jump at uh, on this number. Uh, Michael, is shelter inflation driven by higher rates? Mortgage rates higher so people aren't selling and the supply decreases. Will falling interest rates improve shelter inflation? It's uh, it's possible. It's a it's it's a good uh, scenario you're you're suggesting here. Uh, shelter is uh, basically uh, rent, and it's uh, both primary rent and owner's occupied rent, which is some figment of some statistician's imagination down in Washington. For statistical reasons, they have to have they have to uh, charge us for living in our own homes uh, to make these uh, their, their accounts of the balance. Uh, but uh, when you look at primary rent, um, it's a supply-demand issue like anything else. I think one of the reasons maybe rent is uh, not coming down as rapidly as I and others might have thought, even people at the Fed, is that uh, there's been a lot of migration. People have been moving uh, from the cold, uh, from the from the north, from the Midwest, uh, down to the south. And so there's been a lot of demand for uh, rental housing um, where, where people have been migrating to. You would think that would be offset by uh, weak, weaker rents uh, in the areas where they're leaving, but that doesn't seem to be uh, happening. Maybe uh, on, on balance, um, there's, uh, well, it's just not happening for one reason or another. Uh, but um, I think we're still going to see rent inflation coming down. And uh, uh, with regards to the housing market, it has some bearing on the housing market. If mortgage rates come down and people decide they'd rather own a house than rent, then that could have some downward impact on rent inflation. But uh, all of this is sort of on the margin. Okay, John, how might either a Trump and a Biden win in November each affect the the market? Uh, well, you said Trump and a Biden, so uh, curse on both their houses. Maybe they'll both win. We'll put them both in the White House and uh, lock, lock the doors and throw away the keys. Um, but... Um, I don't know. I mean, I keep going to my fallback position of, and I've mentioned it before, that uh, look how well the economy and the stock market have done, despite Washington, despite who's in the White House. And uh, clearly, when uh, we're looking at uh, Trump and Biden, it's uh, not too hard to come up with uh, reasons to dislike both of them. Um, or, of course, uh, for, the, for those uh, who are for one or the other, there are reasons to like both of them. Uh, but uh, certainly very partisan candidates uh, bring out uh, the partisanship in uh, in America, uh, maybe more than than alternative uh, candidates, but uh, they're clearly the, the, the top candidates right now. Uh, my bottom line of, of it is uh, I think that, you know, wh whoever wins, um, the, the economy and market will uh, have its own internal dynamics. As I've said before, there's a lot of us that go to work every day, like you and me. Uh, we spend our day trying to figure out how, figure out how to do our business, make things better, uh, and uh, figure out how to do that in the face of uh, the challenges thrown at us by Washington. So I think we'll continue to do that. Uh, Willem, you refer to a recession in China. World Bank data show 5.2% real GDP growth for 2023 and expectations of 4.5% in 2024. Don't you believe the data, or do you believe potential growth in China is more than uh, 5%? Good question, Willem. Uh, yeah, I guess I kind of dispute the numbers, or I, I'm kind of arguing for all practical purposes, uh, everything that is relevant to thinking about how what the Chinese economy is doing uh, suggests that they're in a fairly severe recession. Uh, we know that when things were going well, 20% of their economy was uh, based on um, a prop, a, a real estate, uh, you know, buying, build, building, and uh, buying uh, apartments. 
Uh, and that uh, whole market is completely and totally imploded. And my sense is that uh, that property bubble was bigger than anything the Japanese uh, did in the 80s or that Americans did uh, in, in, uh, in 2000 to 2008. Um, and so that obviously is depressing uh, the price of copper. So I'm watching the price of copper as an indicator of whether things are getting better in China. And so far, the answer is no. Uh, it, actually, things might be getting worse. Why? Well, you would think that with mortgage rates coming down, with interest rates coming down, expected to come down, that uh, there'd be more excitement in the copper market about demand for copper to build homes in the United States. Uh, and so maybe there is, but uh, not enough to offset the weakness, uh, weakness coming out of China. Uh, also watching the price of oil, as we all are, is another indicator of global economic activity. And China is a major player in the oil market. And uh, the demand there doesn't seem to be what it had been when they were doing e extremely well. Um, so those are uh, some aspects of, of my, my thinking. I think the demographics is also a structural impediment to growth. Uh, so, um, you know, maybe, maybe it's more accurately described as a growth recession, though the numbers you tossed out uh, are, 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 are legitimate, they're out there, and somebody's assessment of what China's economy is doing, uh, not mine, uh, based on what I'm seeing anecdotally on, and, uh, on the side. Um, with your rolling recession, this is Joel, uh, with your rolling recession to rolling recovery view, what sectors do you see next up in the process? Thanks. Well, housing clearly is, uh, single family housing is clearly next up in a rolling recovery. And uh, guess what? The home building stocks figured that out a while ago. Uh, so uh, there may not be much opportunities there, but housing related uh, retail sales, uh, goods uh, demand should pick up along with housing activity. So some of the retailers related to housing activity should uh, be seeing better comps as uh, people start to buy things for, for their houses, whether they're existing homes or, or new homes. Um, the, um, the, the commercial real estate market is, is uh, still in a rolling recession, particularly in the office building area, but, uh, some of the other areas, maybe a, a smaller suburban uh, areas, su suburban developments, especially in the South, uh, where people are migrating to, um, those still look, look absolutely, uh, uh fine. I had been thinking that there's a uh, rolling recovery coming in goods. I still think that. Uh, but uh, this uh, New York uh, State um, survey is, uh, is is something to be considered. And let's see what the Philadelphia Fed says. I'll take one more here from David. Will the Fed try to maintain a real 2% Fed funds rate as inflation declines? Well, uh, you know, their goal is 2% uh, nominal. They aren't, they haven't been talking about that as a, as a, as a they haven't been talking about a 2% real rate. Um I think they'll keep it the way it is uh, rather than confuse everybody. Uh, it's easier to explain uh, w why you want the 2% uh, Fed funds rate rather than 2% minus the, the CPI inflation rate to the public and politicians. And so I, I don't think they're going to be doing real. Uh, but uh, if they really do want to lower interest rates in response to inflation falling, then they will make that real argument uh, to the rest of us and uh, use that as an argument for lowering uh, interest rates. Um, on the other hand, um, I'm I'm skeptical that the real rate means much of anything, especially when you're comparing uh, a year-over-year -year CPI inflation rate to an overnight Fed, Fed funds rate. Uh, so uh, I, I raise some uh, questions in that regard. At any rate, uh, have a good week. Let's do this again next week, and uh, all the best. Mm -hmm.